Thank you, Melinda. No pressure. Uh, thank you, Melinda, and, and again, thank you to CETA for staging yet another exceptional State of the Nation event, and uh, the surrounds here are absolutely outstanding. Nice to have a, a, a new room for dinner. Um, it's an honour for me to facilitate the discussion this evening, a very important one. Before I start, I'd also like to acknowledge the owners of the land in which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. They are, of course, the keepers of our oldest memories and traditions and are an integral foundation upon which we build uh, Australia's future. Um, it's fair to say that our guest this evening covers two portfolios amongst the most crucial for our economic and social development, those being Foreign Affairs and the Ministry for Women. Um, having served as a political advisor to some of the most significant figures in liberal uh, politics of their time, uh, Maurice Payne went on, a, uh, on to a career as a public affairs advisor in the finance industry. In 1997, Maurice filled a casual vacancy to represent the people of New South Wales uh, in the Australian Senate and then was elected in 2001, 2007, 2013 and 2016. Maurice has served as Shadow Minister for Indigenous Development and Employment, Shadow Minister for COAG, Shadow Minister for Housing. She played an active role in the Senate and has been a member of both Joint and Senate Committees, including as Chair of the Joint Standing Committee for Foreign Affairs, Defence, Trade and Chair of its Human Rights Subcommittee. In September 2013, Maurice was appointed as Minister for Human Services in the newly elected Abbott Coalition Government. And on the 21st of September 2015, she was promoted to the Cabinet as Minister for Defence. Uh, Maurice was also appointed uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs in 2018. And post-election, she added the Ministry for Women just to get done before breakfast, I think, Maurice. Um, I had the opportunity to engage with uh, Senator Payne in her previous portfolio and was always struck by her ability to take counsel, to listen and then to speak. Um, and I think perhaps it's not that common that it gets done in that order. Uh, and Maurice does therefore stand out in the crowd uh, as a minister of substance when she does have something to say. Um, I've always looked forward to her words of wisdom and uh, I'm looking forward, Maurice, to hear what you have to say to us this evening before we say, take some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff and uh, Melinda. Ladies and gentlemen, I also wish to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, it's a special opportunity for me to uh, visit uh, the National Museum uh, here this evening, notwithstanding the fact that I've been working in Canberra one way or another for uh, over 20 years, I can count on literally one hand the opportunities I've ever had to visit the National Museum, so I feel quite privileged tonight. Thank you for not having us at Parliament House. <laughs> um, can I acknowledge uh, some the very distinguished guests, uh, one and all, who are in the room this evening, particularly the members of, uh, of our diplomatic corps. It's a great pleasure to um, speak to you tonight at what is uh, a distinguished forum on uh, the state of the nation. I want to congratulate CEDA on your 40th anniversary and the important contribution that CEDA makes to generating ideas on, public po on Australian public policy. I'm always very pleased to uh, speak at CETA gatherings. I think uh, the last time I did one was in Queensland as Australia's Defence Minister. Uh, so um, I've transitioned slightly uh, from there in a very lateral sense, uh, but uh, great to be back. A couple of points that uh, I want to make uh, as I uh, start uh, this evening, and particularly uh, given uh, today's announcement by the uh, Treasurer and the Finance Minister, I want to uh, talk very briefly about uh, our record of, of economic reform here at home in Australia, because it is particularly notable that as a result 
of the government's economic plan and responsible budget management, uh, my colleagues uh, were able to announce today that the federal budget has returned to balance for the first time in 11 years. For some, uh, I find, and having gone through a campaign, or in fact in my family, two campaigns this year, uh, I find those, uh, those discussions are not always uh, front of mind on the uh, streets and corners of Western Sydney, where I live and work, uh, overwhelmingly uh, previous to this job anyway. Uh, but the importance of that, I think, can't be overestimated, because it actually matches very well with Australia's role in shaping global norms that have enabled broader economic progress internationally, and that's an achievement of which we are also very proud. CEDA's own recent report, Connecting People with Progress, captured a really important principle, I think. Reform and economic development are not ends in themselves, but must be geared towards actually making people's lives better. Equally, Global rules and norms have been rightly shaped over many decades to reflect what the international community, Australia included, has judged will deliver the best outcomes for everyone. And it's the importance of these rules and norms that I'd like to talk to you about this evening in a context that you'll be familiar with. The power of competition on a level playing field governed by a code we all agree on. Speaking to a business audience, I'm optimistic I will be among friends when I say that healthy, positive competition is something that we favour. Our international system of rules and norms has created stability and prosperity by allowing most disputes, clearly not all, but most, to be resolved peacefully and enabling commerce to flourish. This system is under strain today as differences and disagreements emerge over what are the right kinds of rules and who benefits from them. Nobody denies the challenge that Australia faces as the distribution of economic and strategic weight, coupled with, for example, the emergence of new technologies, change our circumstances at a pace it was difficult to anticipate. Australia's strategic ally and our largest trading partner are engaging in a period of competition which we are approaching in a considered, calm way to ensure that our responses, our direction, are well managed and strategically focused. The fact of the competition is beyond denial. But the nature of that competition itself is still variable, and with that, we need to be shaping our responses appropriately. Of course, as I alluded to, competition itself, when it's on a fair level playing field, conducted within clear rules, is, with the, is actually in our interests. Australia, on the international stage, must be continuing to support a rules-based international order which is founded on values that enhance stability and prosperity for all people. For Australia, for me, they include values such as freedom, openness, inclusiveness and respect by each nation for the sovereignty and independence of others. At times, that will mean speaking our mind or taking actions that are disagreeable to others. It might seem, occasionally, easier not to speak or to act. But in my view, it is in our long-term interest to remember our core values. Our values are good for business because they underpin the rules and the norms that support predictability and consistency, and thereby, create or enable the long-term conditions for prosperity. Consider fairness in trade. I believe fairness is a valued Australian principle. It's part of who we are. Trade deals rely on all parties keeping their promises and when there are disputes, having agreed processes to resolve them justly and fairly. Unfair dealing is anathema to countries who work within this system of trade rules and who care about their international reputation. 
an international system of rules that underpins and encourages fairness across the board has, therefore, allowed us to prosper. The rules themselves, it's widely acknowledged, will need to be updated and modernised to keep pace with changes in technology and economic conditions, but the values that constitute their foundation are enduring. And Australia will need to remain clear about our values and core interests, and we continue to be active in prosecuting them. Fortunately, we have a strong track record, regionally and more broadly, of using our diplomacy actively and effectively, a fact that is, I think, underappreciated. And I want to give you a few quick examples on a traverse of our diplomatic history. In the 1970s, Australia was already deeply engaged with ASEAN, the Association of Southeast uh, Asian Nations. And at that time, the beginning comprising Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore and Thailand. We played an essential role as a facilitator as these five nations put aside their own differences and signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. And then in 1974, we became the first of ASEAN's 10 dialogue partners, a treasured and important relationship between Australia and ASEAN. By the end of that decade, ASEAN was already a bastion of stability to the south of what was still a troubled Indochina. We then played a supportive role when Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and later Cambodia joined the ASEAN fold. Another 15 years from that, in 2009, we signed the ASEAN Australia New Zealand FTA. This year, we've warmly welcomed the ASEAN outlook on the Indo Pacific. It expresses a complementary vision for our region to the one that we share with like minded partners, including the United States, with Japan, and with India. So, this Southeast Asia story of which we are part is one of peace building, prosperity and partnerships to create the stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific, our region. Moving slightly further north, of course Australia and China established diplomatic relations in 1973, but our understanding of one another took a few years to evolve. By the end of that decade, after the establishment of diplomatic relations, we had set up the well-regarded Australia-China Council. We celebrated its 40th anniversary last year. Many distinguished Australians have served as members of the Australia-China Council. So 40 years on, we see the current chair of the council, Warwick Smith, now working to help us establish the recently announced Foundation for Australia-China Relations to further strengthen ties, harnessing the efforts of federal and state agencies, of peak bodies, of NGOs, of cultural organisations, of the private sector and the Chinese-Australian community, that over one million person diaspora here in, uh, in Australia. We have an Australia-China Comprehensive Strategic Partnership as the framework for our engagement while our economies benefit enormously from the free trade agreement between our two countries. Yes, there are differences that arise inevitably from our distinct political systems. We haven't made the mistake of ignoring those differences. Rather, we act in our national interest, working to resolve them respectfully and always looking for areas of common ground where we can cooperate, work together. It's well known, Australia is, uh, China is Australia's largest trading partner. Less often noted, perhaps, is the fact that Australia is China's sixth largest source of imports. Our goods contribute to China's manufacturing base and economic growth, while our services improve quality of life in China, especially uh, in healthcare. We've also been a champion of developing those international rules of the road that have been instrumental to the stability and the prosperity of our region. 
we were at the forefront of negotiations that produced the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the UNCLOS. It's often called the Constitution of the Oceans. And the UNCLOS has underpinned stability and security in our region and around the world, including through the peaceful settlement of disputes. We have the world's third largest maritime jurisdiction. We have an enormous stake in upholding these rules and norms. The Maritime Boundary Treaty with Timor-Leste was a landmark for UNCLOS and for international law. I was particularly honoured to be in Dili in Timor-Leste with the Prime Minister just a few short weeks ago when the treaty entered into force on the 30th of August exactly coinciding with the referendum of the, of the anniversary of the referendum that paved the way for Timor-Leste's Timor independence. This conciliation under the UNCLOS, under the convention, was the first of its kind. As two democratic nations, as close neighbours, Australia and Timor-Leste demonstrated the value of international law and the rules-based order. And I would say, as an aside, it is difficult for me to recall a more singular honour uh, in my professional career than having been in Dili on the 30th of August 1999 as an observer of the vote for uh, independence uh, on that day and returning literally 20 years later to the day as Australia's foreign minister to record that uh, particular anniversary. Uh, the fourth uh, example that uh, I would, uh, would raise, it's also close to home. In 1971, Australia was a founding member of the Pacific Islands Forum, which has become a key part of our regional architecture. It's enabled us to work in close partnership with our Pacific neighbours to address most pressing issues, including our regional security, and most recently in that context through the 2018 Nauru Boy Declaration, and particularly in the context of climate change. Nearly half a century later, our communities, our histories, our values are deeply intertwined with our neighbours. Our future is also intertwined, more so than ever, with Australia's Pacific Step Up, through which we are sharing the responsibilities, the challenges of ensuring the region's sovereignty, stability, security and prosperity. I hope that those four examples underscore my point that Australia has used our diplomatic skills crafted through my department and more broadly to considerable effect in the past. And I have every confidence that we can continue to do that into the future. Of course, the way we exercise our diplomacy evolves as the strategic environment, as technology, as economic circumstances evolve. We're ready to take a leading role in keeping the international rules and norms fit for purpose. Where the rules need modernising, we will help to harness that international will to bring them up to date. And we've seen that already in the trade dispute between the United States and with China. As the Prime Minister and other members of the government have said, we recognise that international trade rules need to be reformed. There is understandable concern right now about the differences between the United States and China. A trade war between the world's two largest economies is in nobody's interests. We urge and have continued to do so, to urge both sides to resolve it and to do so in a way that reinforces our open rules-based trading system without undermining the interests of other nations. We recognise, for example, that intellectual property theft, that forced technology transfer are wrong. Lopsided trade and investment practices are unfair. And it's precisely to ensure that such disputes continue to be resolved in accordance with international rules and norms that we believe these rules must be modernised. Indeed, extraordinary leaps in technology 
mean that the types of goods and services that are now being traded under the auspices of the World Trade Organization are in danger of being unrecognizable to the rules written in an area dominated by trade in, in an era dominated by trade in commodities. The US-China trade dispute, though, is but one lens for considering Australian interests. Importantly, and it's imperative, I think, that we don't lose sight of this, is the distinct set of national interests that is engaged in each of these relationships in their own right. The US is, and will remain, our most important strategic ally. And I make these observations this evening on the cusp of a state visit by the Prime Minister of Australia to Washington tomorrow. Only the second state visit of this administration and the second, uh, the, the second state visit uh, following previous visit by Mr Howard with President Bush some many years ago now. China is a vital economic partner and a major power. And we are, as a nation, continually deepening and engaging with relationships across the region. For example, with countries like Japan, with India, with Indonesia, with those ASEAN nations uh, with which our relationships go back so far. As the Prime Minister said in his Asia Link speech delivered some months ago, now just after the election, we should not be sitting back passively and awaiting our fate in the wake of a major power contest. As a regional power with global interests, Australia can and must find common ground with other countries to marshal the cooperation that we need. We've done it before. We did it in the late 1980s when we founded APEC to drive economic cooperation in our region, to get businesses involved in shaping rules and to push for global trade liberalisation. We played a role in the establishment of the World Trade Organization and we should, therefore, be playing a role in reforming it to maintain its relevance. More recently, with Japan, we led the conclusion of the 11-nation Trans-Pacific Partnership. The TPP is so much more than a trade agreement. It will help to improve predictable, open and inclusive rules. To use my uh, friend and colleague Simon Birmingham's words, this agreement, the TPP, has given institutional, legally binding form to Australia's view of regional economic order. And in recent weeks, uh, Simon has been to Beijing and Bangkok to help shape how the parties to the proposed Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, including China, plan to take that agreement forward. At the same time, we are taking a proactive role in shaping rules in spheres that currently lack proper international regulation, such as space and cyberspace. We're central, for instance, in two UN groups to develop rules of the road for what is acceptable conduct in cyberspace. And we'll work with other countries to ensure that states and non-states who undertake malicious cyber activity are held to account maintaining the international rules in our national interest. Of course, as I have already this evening, we acknowledge that there are and will be pressure points. There'll be times when ripples in geopolitics mean business buzz does become more difficult in the short term. But the goal of our effort must be Stability and security on terms that are consistent with our values and long-term interests in a way that empowers our people to improve their lives. Just as leaders of the business community seek to make their organisations competitive over the longer term, you can be assured that the Morrison government is focused on the long-term prosperity of our nation. We will continue to help shape a world that remains free and fair in which individual and collective rights are protected and people and nations are not subjected to coercion and pressure. That's a world in which the private sector is free to pursue innovation and develop the big ideas that will power and shape the economies and the societies of the future. Fair competition 
on a level playing field governed by rules. That is the world we want. It's a world to which the people in this room, I suspect, have become accustomed and, which, and in which many of you have prospered. As a nation, we have a history of helping to provide solutions. We've earned a good name on the international stage. And that's a core message that I will take with me on Sunday to the United Nations in New York. The government believes that the UN remains central to maintaining the rules and institutions that underpin a free, open, inclusive and prosperous global order. This Unger Leaders Week will traverse many, many issues. Climate, health, sustainable development and oceans. We will discuss nuclear non-proliferation, counter-terrorism, our work to achieve justice for the victims of the downing of flight MH17 and their families. More than ever, Australia is and will continue to be active and vigorous within the international system. There's no doubt that these are challenging times. However, we have strong experience of engagement in influencing our region and our strong contribution to the rules. While cooperation between government and industry and business has always been important, the tech advanced world of few to no borders in which we live means that such cooperation is more important for our prosperity and our security than ever. So I encourage you, the communities, the businesses, the institution, institutions that you represent to join me in taking Australian values to the world and in securing our interests in a peaceful, open, inclusive and free international order. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this evening and uh, I think Jeff has indicated uh, a couple of questions coming my way. Uh, as I said to the boys and girls at the Armidale School uh, in uh, the city of Armidale last week, that'll make my fifth question time for the week, so you'll crack ten. Uh, and uh, I think that that's uh, a very good way to finish my week. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. I have Thank to move you. out of the way. Thank you, Maurice. There was absolutely no disappointment in, in that, uh, that speech. Uh, having lived in Beijing myself for seven years, uh, the concepts of uh, free and fair trade were somehow explained and the concept of win-win was explained and, and the European view of that is win-win doesn't mean you win twice. It means one of us win once hmm. each time. Um, I, I, maybe I'll open the batting with a question uh, on um, bilateral trade agreements, FTAs. The, the, is, is an FTA actually the result of a failure of the WTO to get its job done? Is there, is there a perceived, a perceived uh, uh, failure that the rules-based order is being able to be administered by the official body? I think that's an, an interesting um, proposition. I think it's very important that we're able to work in the multilateral and in the bilateral at the same time. And our job uh, as, as a government, our job uh, as a business and industry is to endeavour to achieve the best outcome for our nation, for the businesses that support and employ and engage uh, millions and millions of people across uh, this country. So whilst we pursue uh, the agendas that exist at the, at the multilateral level, I'm absolutely sure that uh, we we should be pursuing the bilateral imperative uh, as well. And I think uh, Simon uses um, uh, a very good uh, statistic. When we were elected in, uh, in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, um, I'm going to get the date wrong, but we have increased the amount of, uh, of trade covered in Australia by FTAs from about 13% to about 70%. So we have opened up opportunities and markets. When you travel around Australia uh, as much as uh, I do with my colleagues, uh, you are always meeting a producer or mm. a uh, business that wants to work out a different way to get into uh, a market through an FTA opportunity. They are lobbying Simon very hard at the moment across uh, all sorts of platforms. Uh, he is Australia's leading expert on cheese. 
uh, in, uh, in 2019 uh, in pursuit of the EU FTA. Not uh, called Camembert, I think. <laughs> no, indeed. Uh, but uh, I think we can do both. It's kind of like uh, walking and chewing gum at the same time. Okay, I actually neglected to encourage everybody in the room to use the app um, to lodge questions because I can't see any coming through. It wasn't so, the, so that I could ask two in a row. Uh, <laughs> I haven't we, got the app. We're not I can't seeing any coming through question. on the app. So I, I that would be a Dorothy Dixer if I did that. I, I think, uh, Maurice, we're a bit fortunate that you've had uh, experiences in defence and foreign affairs. Um, and it's a bit of an efficiency drive. I guess you <laughs> represent a two plus two in one person. Uh, you're able to represent both defence and foreign affairs, where most other countries have that split. <laughs> but, it, but on your speech tonight, of course, there's, an, there's a, a linkage to trade that you can't deny. And those things, as the world gets more uh, globalised, digitalised, are, I think, inseparable. Is, is there room for Australia to do more 2 plus 2s or different formats of 2 plus 2s? We, uh, to, just to hop back to the, the trade question, for example, I think the best um, bilateral relationship uh, where that's represented is uh, our joint ministerial forum with Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, a formal uh, forum of the foreign minister, the trade minister and uh, the defence minister. Uh, we have been uh, engaged in, uh, in those for uh, many, many years now, uh, held alternately in, uh, in each country, and we always take the opportunity to engage uh, where we are able with uh, business in the holding of those uh, fora. Uh, we have two plus twos in some of our most strategic relationships and our most important relationships. Uh, we have um, the well-renowned Ozmin, uh, followed hot on its heels with Orkmin. I didn't choose these. Uh, followed by, uh, of course, a two plus two with Japan, uh, two plus two with uh, Korea. We are uh, if I recall correctly, we are one of only two countries in the world with whom Korea holds a two plus two. So to actually have this two plus two, you've got to have a dance partner. Uh, and uh, other countries are, uh, on occasion, reticent about establishing that process. So it, it takes a while. We have a two plus two with Germany, uh, initiated uh, under our government uh, in recent years with the strong support of Matthias Cormann. Uh, who can attend that function if he wishes in multiple languages. Um, <laughs> and uh, Indonesia, uh, also a, a two plus two. And then uh, obviously through the multilateral fora, whether it's uh, the uh, East Asia Summit, uh, whether it's uh, the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum and so many others, uh, we then have multiple layers of meetings through summit season, as it's known, and uh, throughout each year. I'm heading to, uh, to Chile later this, uh, this year for the APEC foreign ministers meeting. That's still a, uh, a strong and, uh, and engaged body. So there are plenty of opportunities. And as we identify countries with whom we should develop uh, a closer, more strategic relationship, then I'm sure we will, uh, we will look at further two plus twos. Thanks. Can I see a hand up? We'll maybe use the old tech. We'll m move the microphone around if there's any other question. I fear I'm okay. between everyone and dinner. Thank you. Hi, Maurice. It's Carly Hi, Carly. from the University of Melbourne. Um, you're also the Minister for Women, so I'd be interested in your um, priorities for the advancement of women, awesome. both in Australia and internationally, in your um, current portfolio. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, and I am, and uh, it feels like a, a job that I've been uh, understudying for for two decades in Parliament, uh, in a way, because. Uh, supporting uh, and engaging with Australian women has been a, a focus for me for my entire uh, elected career and indeed prior to that. It is a very interesting confluence of uh, portfolios and I have found it even in uh, the short few months since uh, the swearing in uh, in May, I have found it to be immensely powerful in our region. The opportunity to have a conversation at key bilateral and, and multilateral tables about the importance of gender equality in our region and to do that wearing the hat of Australia's foreign minister is really quite compelling. And my counterparts, uh, of whom there are few women in the foreign minister category, um, Foreign Minister Retno Masudi in Indonesia, Foreign Minister Kang in uh, 
uh, in South Korea. Uh, my counterparts around the region uh, now know that this is a subject for discussion in any meeting with me. It was before, but it has a real reinforcement uh, because of the specific portfolio uh, responsibility. What is particularly interesting is the, and unsurprisingly, but it is very interesting, to see the uh, similarity in focus and in issues that we have to deal with, and we deal with them in different ways, but the issues are so similar. Economic security, the ability to be educated and to work and to gain economic security uh, for women and for their families. Uh, the imperative of safety and freedom from family and gender-based violence. It matters not whether I am meeting with the UK Secretary of State for Trade, who is also the Minister for Women in the UK, or with uh, the Minister for Community Development in Papua New Guinea. The challenge that we are presented with by the scourge of domestic violence, of gender and family-based violence in our world and in every single country, city, town, village in our world is, without exaggeration, terrifying. It has a stultifying effect on the capacity of women to even contemplate pursuing economic security. It has a stultifying effect on their capacity to care for their own children uh, and to be members of their own communities. So I am uh, particularly focused, certainly in the Pacific in the first instance, on finding a way to work more closely with uh, ministers and parliamentarians and women in leadership to endeavour to address some of these issues. And then thirdly, uh, in Australia and elsewhere, a focus on women in leadership uh, and representation. Uh, in a parliamentary sense, so from my own perspective, last week I escorted Senator-elect Sarah Henderson into the Senate chamber for her swearing in. Fifteen years ago, I escorted her predecessor, Mitch Fifield, into the chamber in exactly that same position on the Victorian Liberal Senate ticket. But the difference uh, in escorting Sarah Henderson into the room was that changed the numbers in the Australian Senate to half-half, half women and half men. It's an amazingly powerful... Thank you. I claim no credit, but I claim great excitement in seeing that happen. It's an amazingly powerful message, let me say, to the girls and boys who have been part of all of our families for decades and decades, who are sitting in the galleries above the Senate chamber to see as many women as men on those benches. It is so powerful. Uh, and uh, that is uh, a really special uh, obligation on uh, our leadership, on women in leadership in Australia, to ensure that we are working to increase those numbers, not just in the parliament, but on uh, ASX 200 boards, on boards all over the country. I can see some friends of mine who are male champions of change out there uh, who are doing that work every day because uh, that is not a ball we can afford to take our eye off. Absolutely. It goes back to the opening comments that you run two of the most important uh, portfolios in Australia mm, thank you, for Jeff. the social and economic welfare. Uh, we had one question there, and I've got one question on the, on the uh, screen. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Simon DeBell from ABB. I'm reluctant to take you away from that focus on women and the progress that has been made, but I'd just like to pick up on one particular comment you made in the speech, which was around the strategic importance of Japan and also India. Japan, of course, has been both a major source of intellectual property into Australia as an important trading partner. India is emerging, a very important power, potentially a market for us in terms of energy. How do you see those two countries acting as a bit of a counterweight to some of the tensions we have in our US and China relationships? Uh, thank you um, very much. I actually came here this evening from uh, a meeting of the uh, ministerial champions under the India Economic Strategy authored by Peter Varghese and uh, released last year. Uh, ministers who are leading four lines of effort in our uh, growing 
uh, engagement with, uh, with India. And that economic strategy, a weighty tome for anyone who uh, has not picked it up, I'd go online if I were you, a weighty tome sets out uh, a very, very comprehensive approach to uh, growing Australia's strategic and economic relationship with India. We've seen in, in recent years uh, a diplomatic push uh, in that regard. Australia has four posts uh, in, uh, in India now and hopefully in the first quarter of next year I will officially open the fourth of those, our post in Kolkata, which, uh, in which the Consul General has been working since uh, April of this year, uh, but it's a heritage building and apparently it takes a little while to fix that up in India uh, and frankly in inner Sydney, so no surprises there. Uh, but the shifts in India's outward approach, in their outward-looking approach, I think are really in, well encapsulated in strategic terms in the development of what is known as the Rosina Dialogue. The Rosina Dialogue is, is very much like the Shangri-La Dialogue, for any of you who have ever heard of that as a, a key strategic uh, meeting annually in Singapore, which has developed uh, over... Wow, since Robert Hill was Australia's Defence Minister, so uh, some time now, has developed over those years to become a seminal event uh, about key strategic issues in our region. India has created a dialogue of its own called Rosina, and uh, it is growing in a very similar way. When you can see the commander, Indo-Pacific Command of uh, the US military there as a keynote speaker, when you can see foreign ministers and leaders from around the world prepared to go to New Delhi and to engage in that dialogue, you see that strategic engagement which is growing uh, in appreciable terms uh, from, uh, from India. Uh, our four uh, focuses are in agriculture with our ministerial champions, agriculture, education, tourism and resources. And so under Simon Birmingham, Dan Tien, Bridget McKenzie and Matt Canavan, uh, and I think two of the three of us, if not uh, three of the four, have all visited India in the last six months. That's an indicator for you of, uh, of, our, of our focus. Japan, of course, uh, is our most like-minded uh, partner in uh, Asian partner in uh, in this region, and the two plus two, which uh, which Jeff asked about, is indicative of that. Uh, it is uh, a very important uh, dialogue and goes up a level when we uh, elevate to a trilateral strategic dialogue. And I had uh, meetings with um, then J Japanese Foreign Minister Taro Kono and uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on the sidelines of, of meetings in Bangkok just uh, six weeks ago. That enables us to talk about exactly the issues that I discussed tonight, about the sorts of trade and markets that we want to see in our region, about the freedoms, about the sovereignty and independence that we want to see flourish in the Indo-Pacific. And Australia is uniquely placed between India and Japan, one foot in the Indian Ocean and one foot in the Pacific Ocean, to really be able to bring some of those threads together, and that's uh, certainly an ambition of mine. Uh, I guess uh, I've got one uh, from the screen, so it would be almost impossible not to talk about Brexit. Um, and I noticed that that particular foreign minister made it through to be prime minister, but I'm not sure how long lived that will be. Um, I wonder, Maurice, if you could uh, offer a, a comment about uh, the consequences for Australia of a deal or no deal Brexit. Well, I think our focus uh, absolutely is on uh, ensuring uh, a very positive outcome for Australia. As I, um, as I said uh, earlier, uh, the UK Secretary of State for Trade, Liz Truss, uh, has been in Australia this week as part of her international consultations uh, on the post-Brexit uh, environment. And we very much want to be front and centre in the development of those trade agreements uh, in the post-Brexit environment. Uh, I haven't commented on uh, internal matters in, uh, in the UK uh, through, the, through this process since the, uh, since the uh, referendum uh, and what has occurred subsequently, and I don't intend to start tonight. I will 
say, though, that Liz I, Truss... I, try, I did try. Right. Yeah, it was a good effort. I will say that uh, Liz Truss, who uh, was, uh, I think, visiting Australia for the first time and represents a constituency in Norfolk in which the largest urbanised community numbers 20,000 and has a name I can't currently recall, came last night with us to the so-called midwinter parliamentary ball in Canberra. I'm not sure about the impact on bilateral relations. She got to experience uh, uh, the warm-up act, which was unique. Uh, she got to experience uh, the speeches from the uh, Prime Minister and the, uh, the leader of the opposition, and of course the uh, patter, um, very sophisticated, very witty, very inside the beltway of Annabel Crabbe and David Spears. I think by midnight she was extremely confused, excused herself and went home. Uh, so uh, it so that's was, the analogy uh, to Brexit, I guess. <laughs> no, no. I'm just saying if I was choosing how to introduce someone to Australian politics, that would not be my chosen method. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, uh, unfortunately we've run out of time and Maurice has actually been very, very generous to have joined us despite other commitments both before and after uh, our event tonight.